happy day drinking with Wes Hagen. I am Wes Hagen, your host. I am the winemaker uh, and the brand ambassador for the Miller Family Wine Company. Uh, and I'm here Mondays, uh, Wednesdays, and Fridays bringing you guys uh, all the best information that I possibly can uh, on wine and wine education. And the whole goal here is to put together sort of a beautiful, uh, you know, bunch of work that as we uh, progress through this show and uh, continue to teach you guys everything I know about wine, uh, we are going to end up launching um, a YouTube site and a, a website called the Miller Family Wine School. And that wine school will have uh, all kinds of YouTube videos from the very beginning about learning about wine, learning about Santa Barbara, learning about specific ABAs, learning about specific wine varietals, um, all this stuff. So we're really, really looking forward uh, to improving. Uh, we're going to be improving a little bit on uh, my uh, sort of my equipment and my connections. So over the last few months, I've really gone to work to make this as, as, uh, as good as I can. Although as I've been going through some of these YouTube uh, videos on our YouTube channels, I'm noticing that uh, we're getting, we're getting some, um, uh, some breaking up of the video and sometimes the video doesn't exactly match up with the voice. So the plan is, is to go through the YouTube channels and just basically clean house, make everything beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And, uh, and, and do everything we can to bring you guys meaningful and uh, fascinating uh, wine education, uh, both on Instagram, television, Facebook, and then all of these being um, archived as carefully as we can. So you won't have to go through Facebook pages to find that great, hey, Don, happy day drinking to you, brother, um, that uh, we'll basically have the opportunity to, uh, to make sure that you guys get all the information. Now, I have to warn you today, uh, I do understand that we are, I just got a text on my phone that they may uh, be doing, uh, yes, drinking a white Rhone blend from Paso. We're doing white wines today and Paso fits because we're going to be doing white wines from the Central Coast. So it might be a slightly shorter show today. I'm going to truncate it because we are on the verge of going into a brownout here in Orcutt and Santa Maria. We just got a text from PG&E to expect rolling blackouts. It is warm here on the Central Coast. Today was not quite as warm as it has been the last few days. It got up to a whopping 86 degrees and Phil, hope all is well and things are starting to cool down there on the East Coast so you're not already having to harvest all your fruit. So you guys know what's up over here. Uh, I did hear uh, and we had a conversation. I had a conversation, great conversation with Bob Linquist from Linquist Family Vintners and uh, previously from Coupe and all the other places where he's, he's uh, made amazing wine with his wife and family. Um, and we both had heard stories about people picking grapes. I heard Solomon Hills brought in a tiny bit of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir for a sparkling wine from an undisclosed producer. I'm starting to hear about sparkling wine come in and I'm starting to hear about people. Thank you, James. Um, just uh, James gave his uh, condolences that I'm dealing with PG&E, but you know, um, here we are with electricity, so, you know, can't front on that. I don't make electricity, so uh, I don't judge the people that send it to me, um, although PG&E has certainly had some difficult times in the last few years and perhaps needed to do a little bit more uh, uh, diligence uh, in there. But, I mean, can you imagine if it's your responsibility to provide power from what Ventura to what Arcata? That's, that's, that's a long way. A to V. Oh, Mr. Benton, so nice to have you back. And by the way, if you guys missed uh, Friday's show with, the, uh, you know, uh, with Bob Lindquist, uh, unfortunately, whatever I tried to do to get it to simulcast over to Facebook failed. So I have put it up on the Jay Wilkes Facebook page in a few places, and a lot of other people found the link and put it up too. So I definitely recommend if you're interested in the history of Santa Barbara County wine, uh, check out what Bob Linquist has to say because he is an, a, basically an absolute classic and just such a nice guy. And I, I've, I can't remember interviewing someone, Karen McNeil was incredible too, but who was able to take what he had to say and to condense it in a very, so we had, a, uh, I actually got through every single question in the interview, which does not happen. Normally I write 12 questions and I get through maybe six or seven and I think I got through all 12. And if you have not seen that man tackle the hardcore Dodgers trivia that I threw him, um, in his mind, he just figured out that they had had 18, uh, 18 All-Stars elected, or, or 18, was it 18 Cy Young? It was 11 Cy Young, 18 most valuable players. He figured out how many pennants they had from, from memory. He didn't actually know the number. I mean, the World Series stuff was, was pretty easy. And, uh, you know, he was able to figure out the, the heckling question from, uh, 
uh, from the San Francisco Giants, but that was all well and good. So welcome today to Day Drinking. We're going to launch right into it. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Central Coast. So you know me, I'm all about AVAs. There's 40 AVAs sort of between the Santa Cruz Mountains and the southern part of Santa Barbara that defines the Central Coast. So you've got the North Coast, sort of, like I said, Arcata. I just keep saying Arcata for some way. What up, Humboldt University? Or Cal State Humboldt, I should say. And then so you basically have you basically have the very tip of, of California all the way down just um, north of San Francisco, and that's the North Coast. Generally, it's going to have to be, you know, it, it's, it's delineated, so you have to be close enough to the coast to actually see it. And then if you go a little bit further south from Santa Cruz Mountains down to Santa Barbara, we've got the Central Coast, and then really from um, Ventura County all the way down to Tijuana, Mexico, um, well, the border, uh, basically the South Central or South Coast, South Coast, uh, the South Coast really ABA that represents it. Now, I normally don't consider these coastal designations to be American viticultural areas in the classic sense that there is a very defined region and that region is it's very important to understanding a specific style. I will agree uh, with Larry Schaefer uh, from uh, Tercero Wines here in Santa Barbara and he and I always go back and forth on this and I kind of agree with him that we should stop using Central Coast whenever possible. Now, that being said, I've got two Central Coast Appellated wines from the Miller Family Wine Company to uh, taste and share with you today. One is the Ballard Lane Sauvignon Blanc. This is a 2018, I believe. Uh, this is our current release, delicious Sauvignon Blanc. Central Coast Appellated. So why is the Central Coast a good thing? So I've already said that the Central Coast doesn't necessarily designate something specific. Well, here's the issue. The problem with Central Coast is the same problem we have with the San Ynez Valley. It is huge. It is politically very, um, uh, just uh, very generous for allowing uh, many, many regions to be part of one region. And it just doesn't really mean much. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't mean much because there are Winkler one zones, Gewürztraminer, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc, Muller Thurgau, uh, those type of grapes uh, excel in these cool climate regions. Uh, region two, Chardonnay can go into region one, obviously, but region two is definitely warm enough to ripen Chardonnay. Um, maybe Gamay, maybe some Chenin Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and then in region three, Syrah, all the Rhones, which also do very well in uh, region two, also can ripen in uh, regular years now with a little bit warmer weather um, out in region one. But So you can see that um, we have regions in region four, Nebbiolo, Cabernet, uh, Malbec, um, a Barbera, uh, Zinfandel, um, Petit Syrah, uh, all these really thrive in region four. And in those region fours, that's where it gets hot. Those are the regions that are over 105 degrees today. Even in region 1A, where we are here in the Santa Maria Valley, uh, we still got into the high 80s today. So, um, and we were expected to go into the 90s later in the week before things cool down a little bit. So we are actually, I've been here every night saying, the windows are open and you know we don't have to worry about uh, weather too much but actually this warm weather is uh, is uh, scheduled to persist at least for the next seven to ten days up in the 80s and that really gets stuff moving for us remember one of the facts we talk about all the time here is that 87 degrees is the magic number for grapevines at 87 degrees that is the maximum photosynthetic capacity for a grapevine so depending on the sun and depending on the clouds but 87 degrees is as happy as a grapevine can be 102, a grapevine shuts down, it stops, uh, it closes the stomata on the backs of the leaves, stops respiring, stops photosynthesis, and just goes into survival mode. Same thing happens around 50 degrees, it is 50-55, uh, grapevines think, ooh, this could be a, this could be a cold one, and it uh, could be frost, and I don't want to freeze, so they also close down their stomata, and they basically go into survival mode as well. Uh, and stop respiring acid, that's why cool climate, it's really important because it actually stops uh, uh, the acid from respiring on those beautiful cold nights. Um, so if we really talk a lot about the regions where uh, in the central coast that generally are blended into white wine, I would say that those, uh, those regions generally, I think Santa Barbara County tends to be a little expensive for blending. And I think Santa Cruz Mountains tends to be a little expensive. Santa Barbara kind of likes their seven ABAs. Santa Cruz Mountains like their ABAs. 
Uh, Paso fruit is generally affordable enough that Paso can go into a number of, of blended, uh, blended wines. Some of the Paso designated uh, blended white wines are some of my favorite in the world, uh, like, uh, like the Esprit de Beaucastel Blanc, or Beaucastel Blanc uh, from Tablas Creek, one of the greatest white wines, I think, in California. Now, let's talk Central Coast whites. We're starting here with a little bit of the Ballard Lane Sauvignon Blanc. I had some Chardonnay in my glass, don't hate. But I'm going to dump that, and uh, we don't cry over spilled wine in the wine industry. Um, just dump and go on. It's samples. I get more for free. Is it the best job in the world? So Sauvignon Blanc uh, from the Central Coast, the power is going to be blending. It's going to be taking cool climate, warm climate, moderate climate, and putting it all together to make the best wine possible. There is this misnomer, I think, in California wine, and I think it started actually in Burgundy, that the idea that vineyard designation is the greatest way a wine can express itself. That a single vineyard expressing a single vintage, uh, expressing the dirt, the climate, and that moment is somehow, is somehow gestalt. In, in fact, it may be even quantum in the sense that it, it represents a time and a place simultaneously. That's all well and good if you got 50, 75, or $800 to spend on a great bottle of vineyard designated or Grand Cru wine. What about the rest of us? What if, us, what if we want an $8 glass pour? What if we want a $12.99 wine at the supermarket or at our local brick and mortar or ordering it through wine.com that's gonna be delicious? Well, I'm telling you, that's where the Central Coast comes in. That's where really the rubber meets the road in this whole discussion is QPR, quality to price ratio. If you don't care about price, buy your vineyard designated wines and waste your money. But what I'm saying is wines that are appellated, wines that are specifically from um, Santa Maria Valley and have four different vineyards uh, kind of plugged into one wine are generally going to be better than 75 to 80% of the vineyard designated wines that cost three times as much. And I'll tell you why. If you've been a winemaker for any given amount of time, you know that as you blend vineyards with other vineyards, the wines just get better and better and better. That's why if you're looking at Brewer Clifton, if you're looking at Ken Brown, if you're looking at some of the wines from Aubon Climat, I'm just gonna say the appellated wines are some of my favorite because a lot of times I think they're more, they're more balanced. I mean, they're keeping those barrels that are a little more expressive, maybe even a little more ripe. I'm not talking about Aubon Climat, I'm gonna get a hate letter from Jim Clinton. Ripe, what are you talking about? But what I'm saying is when you add vineyards together, they fill in the gaps that those vineyards cannot give on their own. So A, appellated wines from specific AVAs and different vineyards within that AVA will always represent the AVA, I think in a much clearer manner than a single vineyard wine that only gives you a snapshot of one little piece of dirt in one little section of that AVA. Think about it, if you take you know, grapes from Biencito, you take grapes from Solomon Hills, you take grapes from Sierra Madre, maybe you get even some fruit from Colson Canyon around the corner, whatever, you got all those different dirts and all those different things blending together. So when you have 40, 40 AVAs in the Central Coast, you know, all the way from, you know, up there in Santa Cruz, all the way down to the bottom of Santa Barbara, that gives you 40 different subsets of grapes to pull to make your spice box. So do you want to make a wine with tons of acid? Go to the coast. Do you want to make a wine with very, very generous alcohol and extract and ripeness? You're going to probably want to go you're going to probably want to go a little more inland. Um, if you want to make a wine that's beautifully expressive of a certain place, then you can do that. If you want to make a, um, if you want to make a Chardonnay that really, really tastes like Monterey, but you want a Central Coast appellate, you have the opportunity to actually add wines uh, to make a Central Coast blend that will only, honestly almost make that wine taste more like the place you want it to taste like. Um, in years, in certain AVAs, you can only get what you deal with. It got too hot, it got too cold, it got frost, it got rain, it got hail, what have you. Well, maybe five AVAs away, it didn't happen. So we can take a little bit of that. It's an insurance policy to make beautiful wine. And I think that's really important to understand that a Central Coast appellated wine does not mean it's a cheap wine. It's going to be less expensive, but it actually might provide more pleasure and quality than a wine twice or three times the money because of the ability to blend. So A on whites in the Central Coast. I don't like the term Central Coast. I would prefer to talk about where the wine is actually from, but from the perspective of value, it is really important to have this category of Central Coast wine to fill the gap in the sub $10 glass pour 
all the way up to you know that twenty twenty five dollar premium Central Coast wine that you might find uh, that is really really high quality. But I would expect a Central Coast appellated wine uh, to be somewhere usually between ten and twenty bucks on the shelf, and that right now is I think seventeen dollars is the average price uh, in the Nielsen data that people are paying uh, for wine during COVID. That's down from I think twenty two pre COVID. So I'm not saying y'all are cheap, but you're looking for value, and aren't we all? So you know, uh, we've lost $5 on the average bottle of wine, which if you know uh, how large, you know, wine co companies work, $5 off of, uh, you know, off of a bottle, that's, that's tough. So we are realigning. We are making sure that there's lots of good and delicious wine. So we are increasing the production on these Ballard Lane wines because we know that's what's selling and that's what people are really excited about. Um, the Sauvignon Blanc is crisp and bright, stainless steel, uh, was cold fermented, never touched oak. Not even, uh, it's got a beautiful um, Stelvin screw cap for the top. Oh, it smells delicious, must be a good vintage. Uh, very, very important to understand, uh, even though that, uh, one thing I think Central Coast can do as well, if, even if we're not talking about Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay, you can also do amazing blends. I was just talking uh, to some of my friends over the weekend about this beautiful blend that Bob Link was brought onto the show on Friday, which is 50% Viognier, 50% Chardonnay. And we were having a great conversation about why Californians and Americans don't really dig white blended wines. We tried one at, at Smashberry. It didn't work out, but we're re kind of looking at that and going to probably make a, a drier blend. Maybe it was a little too sweet for people. But having the opportunity of 40 different ABAs, if you're going to make a, a blended white wine from the Central Coast, what can't you do? what you've got every every uh, every kind of region of cool or heat you've got hundreds of grapes to choose from hundreds literally and uh boy you can make some amazing blends so that's that's kind of a little bit about sort of blends in the central coast but i really want to also talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about chardonnay because i think chardonnay is probably the grape that we're going to it's going to get the most attention and probably the highest sales um and i will also mention that uh I think there was, I think I wrote down, there's 90,000 acres in the Central Coast, and the number one grape planted in the Central Coast, not surprisingly, is Chardonnay. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit. We're talking whites today. We're going to do Central Coast reds on Wednesday, talk a little bit more about uh, what makes the Central, uh, Central Coast so amazing, but uh, I want to make sure and uh, see some people that are coming in. So Sean and Beverly. Uh, we got the wine militia. That's probably Lamar. What's up, Lamar? We got Amy. December 11th. That's my brother's birthday. And we got uh, Glines. So nice to have all you guys on board. And uh, we've got uh, we got the Bentons and Phil and Don and Ian. Got some of the regulars and some some other folks. Sick. Thank you, Jim. I, I thought I thought Bob was a great interview. Um, and if you haven't seen the Bob Linquist interview, please go and check it out. And um, definitely be checking in on the YouTube pages in the next week or two because we are going to be putting in a lot of work. And we have noticed that some of the uh, recordings have been a little choppy. So we are, I, we're, I'm investing about $1,000 in, in new equipment to make sure that these shows are as clear uh, and, uh, and watchable as possible. So I just tasted a few grapes yesterday. Phil is in uh, Gardner, New York. He's a backyard viticulturist and an excellent winemaker. He's not the winemaker, but they tasted really good already, like we do the hot, yeah. You know, I always say that, you know, when you taste the fruit, and I don't want to say I don't test the fruit, because I always test the fruit. I like numbers. I like science. But I also have a palate that is really, and Maxime, it's nice to have you there, Maxime and Amy. So I want to say that when you taste fruit uh, in a, in, as a winemaker, um, if you wonder if it's ready, it's never ready. When you know it's ready, you'll taste it. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing that has to develop. I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust an intern to make that decision. Uh, but after, I would say, 15 to 20 vintages, if you really pay attention, you can taste bricks. I can usually hit bricks. Usually within one bricks either way, I'm pretty good. In pH, I'm about 0.1 to 0.2 off. So I've got a pretty, uh, a pretty good palate for wine chemistry. But I also like to know where the numbers are because it might taste candy sweet at 22 and, you know, and, but I want it at 24 uh, for, and I know that I can get a little, and maybe the acid is a little bit higher. So it's always nice to know exactly what's going on. All right. So let's talk about Chardonnay on the Central Coast. So if we're blending a Sauvignon Blanc, because we started with Sauvignon Blanc, 
Where would I go? I would go to the Santa Barbara Highlands. I would go to Happy Canyon, although I think putting Happy Canyon in a Central Coast blend would be a huge waste of money. Um, there is some good Sauvignon Blanc in the warmer uh, regions up in Monterey County, which you could get it at a very, very good price. Um, but I think Paso uh, would be a great place to go if you're a home winemaker. As you know, it's a, a very, very um, weak market for wine grapes this year. So if, if you've ever thought about buying a ton of Cabernet and making two barrels of wine, this year would be the year. In about a month, it'll be ready, and you can probably get it for about, I would say, the fruit will cost you about 10 bucks a case. $10 for a case of wine. 75 cent, 75 cent um, fruit cost in the bottle. Think about that, that's crazy. 500 bucks a ton, you'll be able to find Cabernet this year up in Paso. You could probably go up there with a crew and find places that they're just gonna leave the fruit to hang because no one's gonna buy it because we're just in a really tough place right now with fruit sales. But I think last year, something like 2,500 tons of uh, Cabernet just rotted on the vine up in, uh, up in Paso. So if, if we're, I don't know how I got from Sauvignon Blanc to, uh, to buy, buy, buy Paso Cab, but uh, certainly Sauvignon Blanc will be available uh, this year. And I think Sauvignon Blanc from Paso Robles does a really nice job. I prefer the stuff a little bit on the cool side, but we also get some beautiful Sauvignon Blanc out of uh, out of French Camp Vineyard in the Paso Robles Highlands. So that's good stuff too. What's amazing about, so you're going to get a much more sort of gooseberry, grassy, New Zealand style in the cool climate, and you're going to get a more apple pear, slightly tropical edge on the warmer climate stuff. Higher acid, cool climate, lower acid, uh, warm climate. So putting those together as a Central Coast blend would be a beautiful way to make a very balanced, delicious um, Sauvignon Blanc that could have the hint of grassiness that some people like, but also have the full ripeness to give that mouth coating ripeness so it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't taste like it was just really, really elegant and super, super acidic. So that's kind of uh, where I'll leave Sauvignon Blanc. On the Chardonnay, and this is a Ballard Lane 2017 Chardonnay, we have started to sell the 2018, but the Ballard Lane 17 to me is much more integrated. Um, as Karen McNeil said, you know, balance is born, integrated is earned. Um, and so the balance, the wine is certainly balanced and is starting to show in some integration after uh, two plus years in the bottle. So this is again, it's about an $8 glass pour. Uh, it's about $12.99 on the shelf. I think it's uh, a, a 15, um, but we discount it pretty heavily on the website. Um, these Ballard Lane wines are delicious. They're always available at, uh, you can check out ballardlane.com or millerfamilywines.com or millerfamilywinecompany.com. Um, they all link to the same store. You can always try uh, DD50 as your uh, promo code. You never know what's gonna happen. We are putting together some promotions for all you har hardcore people that are, they're with me going into the fifth month of doing this. So thank you guys so much. Let's talk Chardonnay and the Central Coast. So this is the number one selling Central Coast wine. Chardonnay by far is probably built for this idea of blending a wine from the Central Coast. So again, you're probably not gonna put Santa Rita Hills in a Central Coast blend. You're probably not gonna put Santa Maria Valley in a Central Coast blend. I would say maybe Royal Grande, maybe a little Edna Valley. Prices are a little bit, a little bit lower, but still pretty expensive. Um, you, you're going to want for this wine. You're going to want to bring in fruit between eight hundred and about fifteen hundred dollars a ton. Remember, if you take one percent of the tonnage price of grapes, that should be your bottle cost. One percent. So, thousand dollar ton of fruit. Liberal arts math, ten bucks. So if we want to hit that. $12 price point, we don't want to spend more than $1,200 a ton for the Chardonnay. And just so you know, Chardonnay and the Santa Rita Hills can easily go from four to $5,000, meaning that Chardonnay should be between $4,000 or $40 and $50 a bottle. And when you're seeing Pinot Noir come in, you get it. You know, $5,000 to $6,500, you're looking at a $50 to $65 bottle of wine. Uh, Chardonnay is tasting delicious. I kept it a little extra cold today. It's a little warm in a house without air conditioning. So it is what it is. It'll be 75 in the house today. So we'll open up the windows, try to get it back down. But for right now, nice cold glass of Chardonnay works, uh, works as, a, uh, as an internal uh, air conditioner beautifully. So what I'm, what I'm smelling in this wine, this is going to be a little Monterey. It's going to be a little Santa Maria. Why did we put Santa Maria Chardonnay in a $13 wine? Because we could and we own the vineyard uh, and we had the extra fruit. So whatever, whatever ends up, the nice thing about Miller Family Wines, because we're 
were 2,400 acres of grapes under vine between Biancito, Solomon Hills, and French Camp, we can always put some pretty amazing fruit in wines that might not warrant it for the price point. So I like to say these wines all fight, you know, a couple couple weight classes above their actual weight, you know, which is a very good value wine. So, uh, you know, Chardonnay from a very cool climate is going to show a lot of citrus, uh, sometimes a little hint of like a slightly underripe pineapple. Um, the warmer it gets, you start picking up a little more tropical character. Um, definitely acid really matters. But the cool thing about Chardonnay, which I really didn't know until um, I saw some pretty serious heat spikes at Clopepe, is while Pinot Noir will spike on the sugar during a heat spike like we're having now, Chardonnay kind of rides the heat. It can soak up the heat much, much better than Pinot Noir. So uh, do we grow Chardonnay in Paso? Yes, we do. Is it good? It's really good. Um, I've had 100% Paso Chardonnay. We actually did one at Jay Wilkes, and I was surprised how little we had to mess with the wine or adjust the acidity. The, the grapes actually came in beautifully balanced. So you can use some Paso for a little bit of, you know, kind of that uh, richer brown butter, kind of uh, baked apple um, and uh, ripe pear and a little tropicality, blend in some Edna Valley, blend in some Santa Maria for some good acidity, some minerality. And then you get a very, very nice round wine that has a, and when I say round, I don't mean soft. I mean, it's got a beginning, a middle and an end, like a good story. It's got tension, like a good story. That's a very complete Chardonnay. It's got a really beautiful attack. You get a lot of um, ripe kind of um, rich fruit. A um, little bit of a uh, little bit of like Werther's uh, butterscotch. A uh, little bit like that hint of brown butter. It's not a buttery Chardonnay at all at this price point. Um, making it extraordinary, extraordinarily buttery would have taken a lot of manipulation and a lot of money. But it does have, if you're looking for the brown butter, it's there. If you're looking for a little bit of the kind of... Um, uh, caramel corn character, it's, it's definitely there. Um, the acidity is bright, but not austere. And uh, I think it has this really beautiful scheme of like, a, like ripe green apple and a little bit of like honeydew melon, but it's a really beautifully persistent in the finish all the way back, uh, you know, five, 10 seconds at least. Well, I am really happy to say that we have not yet lost our electricity. Uh, we are expecting, uh, as we, as I said at the beginning, uh, PG uh, has told us to expect a possible sort of uh, rotating uh, brownout. So we'll we'll keep our we'll keep our fingers crossed that we can keep on doing this. But uh, I, I expect if anyone has any questions about the Central Coast, any of the 40 ABAs, the one thing I did do is I I did a little bit of research and kind of um, broke down the ABAs for what I think of the best ABAs for both cool and uh, uh, the cool and the warmer climate. And the cooler climate regions that I would say in the Central Coast include the Santa, Santa Cruz Mountains, Santa Rita Hills, San Luis Obispo, specifically uh, uh, Arroyo Grande Valley and Edna Valley, uh, San Benito, uh, Monterey, and that will include not only Monterey, but the Santa Lucia Highlands, Shalone and the Arroyo Seco. And then obviously Santa Maria Valley, very, very important, cool climate. And then the warmer regions that I really think of within the Central Coast that really make a difference would be San Inez Valley, the warmer side of the San Inez Valley, specifically Happy Canyon. Parts of Ballard Canyon do get fairly warm. And then what? I would say 10 of the 11 Paso AVAs could probably be designated as at least Region 3, if not Region 4. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of the Central Coast of California. Uh, one of the most diverse wine growing regions in the world, one of the most blessed wine growing regions in the world. Listen, no one has the weather that we have. No one has the sunshine. I mean, people have more or less sunshine, but as far as days of sunshine and how the fog, the wind, the Pacific Ocean, the climate, everything, it's like California, you know, there's a reason that California, if it was by itself uh, and not in the United States, would be what the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, and we produce almost, what, 50% of the agricultural products in the United States. So California is an absolute treasure. And if you think of the Central Coast, you know, I, I, think, I think of oh, just the manifest beauty of everything that's out there, from Pebble Beach to Big Sur, Carmel, Morro Bay, San, you know, Santa Barbara, um, Paso Robles, I mean, just, you know, San Luis Obispo, what a beautiful city. 
um, you know, all the way down, you know, from Ventura to Santa Cruz. So it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing time. Uh, yes. So and Dominic says he's going to be probably harvesting some Marquette. And if you haven't had Marquette, it's actually an amazing grape uh, that was, I believe, developed at the University of Minnesota. Go Gophers. And uh, they do a great job. If you've never had a varietal Marquette, uh, they make some fine Marquette. Sancerre. I love it. Yes. Sancerre versus the Central Coast. So Sancerre, of course, would be uh, Loire. It would be um, in the middle of, uh, in, it's definitely inland France. Um, I think Sancerre, uh, you know, the Sauvignon Blanc is going to be a little, probably a little bit leaner, a little more mineral. The, I've, I've had good Sancerre, but most of the Sancerre I've had is great Sancerre. Um, Sancerre from, uh, from amazing producers and fairly expensive Sancerre that was just mineral laden with the Silex soil, uh, tasted like sucking wine through chalk. It was so mineral. So A, I wouldn't say the Central Coast. I wouldn't expect a Central Coast uh, Sauvignon Blanc to be extraordinarily mineral laden because I think that would be sort of a waste. Uh, I think most people that are purchasing and drinking uh, Central Coast Sauvignon Blanc would probably be looking for um, something a little broader, maybe a little more residual sugar. Um, just, you know, as a trade secret, most of the wines at this level are back sweetened, back to about two or three grams per liter, which is basically uh, most human palates pick up residual sugar at about three grams per liter. So that's like, think about dissolving three large paper clips made out of pure sugar into a liter of wine. That's, that's three grams of sugar. So a paper clip weighs about a gram, and if you put three paper clips of, of sugar in a wine and stirred it, would you expect it to be sweet? Of course you wouldn't. Could you, could you perceive it? No. But if I put the original wine next to you in a glass and the wine that had three grams, and you had tasted both of them, and you paid special attention to how the acid hit your palate, because residual sugar buffers acidity. So you put a little bit of residual sugar back in a dry wine, it probably is going to be more popular in the, in, the, in the broad marketplace because people like to say, oh, I love dry wine. But when we put dry wines into the marketplace, slightly off dry wines tend to outsell them uh, in the data. So that's another little thing that people in the wine industry don't like to generally tell you that generally the more expensive wines are the driest wines and the cheapest wines are going to be the sweetest ones, uh, especially if it says uh, soft or, or uh, you know, if it says off dry, you can expect it sometimes to have 15 or 20 grams of residual sugar. And that is when it really, really starts popping out. Sancerre is going to be bone up and dry. Uh, Central Coast, uh, the Sauvignon Blancs is, are going to have two to three grams of residual on average. Uh, Sancerre is going to be laden with minerals. Uh, Central Coast Sauvignon Blanc is going to be uh, much more fruity, much more bright, much more primary. Not more bright. I don't think that's, that's a, but a little fleshier. Um, and I'm certain there are certain Sancerre, uh, Sancerre wines that are just smoking, you know, good and ripe vintages that show a lot of fleshiness. But what my experience with Sancerre is, is uh, it, it wants oysters, you know, it wants, uh, it wants seafood, it wants some bouillabaisse, it wants, uh, it wants something, you know, basically like five, five steamed crabs in a bucket of uh, garlic butter, hammers in a, in a bib. That's what I want when I'm thinking of Sancerre. So definitely the, this Sauvignon Blanc is going to be a little, um, a little fleshier, and I think, and a little softer than you would get from Sancerre. Cool. I'm going to check to see if there's any other questions. That was a good one. Thank you, Maxine, Amy. Thoughts on Los Alamos as a region, those farther east being fairly well known for big roan reds and those ranches farther east, one third. Yeah, okay. Mike, so this is a great question and very, very timely because you may or may not know that my fourth AVA that I wrote and researched is about to be approved. Uh, I've gotten word from the TTB and it hasn't been published in any magazines. We're going to wait till it's uh, the final ruling is published in the Federal Register, probably Monday. I thought it would, might happen today. But Alisos Canyon, where I think you're talking about uh, the old Thompson Vineyard, one of the greatest vineyards in Santa Barbara County, which is now Dovecote, uh, the oh, new owners of Dovecote, uh, Noah and Tamara Rolls, um, hired me to write uh, the Alisos Canyon AVA. And I had to ask myself when I looked at all the maps, okay, here's Santa Maria up here, here's Santa Rita Hills down here, there's nothing in between the San Ynez Valley, Santa Rita Hills AVA and Santa Maria Valley. It is a complete no man's land of AVAs. So I asked myself the question, can I write this AVA as a micro AVA, even though the Los, Los Alamos AVA, which should already be in existence, is not? 
and the process of getting the Los Alamos ADA going has stalled a number of times, I understand. I guess the, uh, the uh, justification of not making uh, a Los Alamos ADA, and if you don't know where Los Alamos is, it's where like, uh, you know, the uh, American flatbread restaurant and, um, oh goodness, just uh, Pico, and you've got Ameri uh, you've got uh, Bob's, uh, you know, Bob's well bread. It's like this little kind of like it was used to be famous for a little thing they do called Mule Days. I mean, it's like absolute tiny little kind of like it, it really looks like an old Western town. And it's got tasting rooms, Casa Dumets, and it's got all sorts of great tasting rooms and great food. Half, I mean, every place there seems to be a fantastic restaurant, fantastic tasting room, and uh, it, it's it's absolutely great. But Los Alamos does not resonate with wine lovers. And the big thing about Los Alamos, not, I don't think Los Alamos in my lifetime will have a generalized American viticultural area. And I'll tell you why. It is more valuable to put Santa Barbara County on the label than it is to put Los Alamos Valley or Los Alamos, however you want to call it. Could we make an ABA in Los Alamos? Oh yeah, I could write it and I could write it in a week. Um, although if someone hired me, I'd tell them it takes two years and charge them close to $100,000. Um, but, you know, that's what consultants do. No, it would take me some time and I would do it right. But the problem is, is Los Alamos is almost completely controlled by large corporate uh, um, wineries. So these large corporate wineries that have thousands and thousands and thousands of acres planted throughout California are looking at, do we want to throw, you know, $100,000 at the creation of the Los Alamos ADA? And if we do, what's, why is it meaningful? Is it, is it cool climate? Not really. Yes, in a Paso perspective. Is it warm climate? No. Is it moderate climate? Yes. Is it about the same climate? Probably gets just under Ballard, uh, Ballard Canyon, somewhere between, you know, the Ballard Canyon heat and Santa Rita Hills heat. Yeah, that's about right. Can you grow Pinot Noir there? You certainly can. And you can grow a lot of Pinot Noir there. So Los Alamos is kind of like a workhorse region that doesn't really feel like it's necessary because it's mostly going into wines that are selling very well, sporting the Santa Barbara County thing. And, you know, you, here's, a, here's a quick insight for you, Mike, is about 10 years ago, we looked very seriously into splitting uh, North uh, Santa Barbara County from South Santa Barbara County. Santa, uh, South Santa Barbara County would have been called Santa Barbara County and Northern, uh, Northern Santa Barbara County would be known as Mission County. Now, we did a, a little bit of research at Vintners, I was on the board back then, of how that would affect our wine brands. Turns out Mission County doesn't mean anything to anybody. Turns out the further you get away from Santa Barbara, the more valuable the term Santa Barbara becomes. Santa Barbara just lights a little fire in people's heads thinking that's the American Riviera. That's a special place. That's a fancy place. That's a place, you know, maybe it was in Falcon Crest, you know, maybe it was in the, the Santa Barbara, the, the, um, the primetime uh, soap opera that was on that's still like one of the top 10 shows in like Eastern Europe, mind blown, right? So clearly Santa Barbara wine has a huge cachet. And that's really, really important to understand in this whole context of the Central Coast that in general, if the wine is from Santa Barbara, clearly Santa Barbara is worth five to $7, probably more per bottle on the shelf than Central Coast would be. Um, there are regions that Central Coast would be about on par with where the fruit's coming out, places in Monterey for sure, where the fruit is generally grown to be put into, into these types of blends. Good stuff. White Hawk and Verna is just to the north are interesting also. Of course, Manfred has a ranch in Elisas as well. On Elisas as well, good. Well, um, the interesting, uh, I should probably uh, get in touch with Manfred Crankle at Sinequanon and if he does have some fruit out there in Elisas Canyon, we should chat because that would get us some really amazing ink as this thing becomes becomes what it is. Uh, Santa Rita Hills versus Santa Barbara. There's a time where it did not. See, that's the thing. So uh, can we can we teach people what, what Los Alamos Valley can do in a bottle of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir? And I would say absolutely. Of course we could, Mike. Um, the same way that when Santa Rita Hills came out, no one knew what the hell we were doing. And we, we took the marketing in Santa Rita Hills in a very different direction. Instead of writing press releases, we just worked harder. We worked harder planting vineyards, growing fruit, making wine, and just nose to the grindstone. 
uh, we would get contacts from Robert Parker, one spectator, one enthusiast. Hey, are you guys all right out there? We never get any information from you. It's like, sorry, we're so busy making wine and growing wine that we really don't have the opportunity to hire a PR company and, and blow smoke up your butt because that's not what we do. Our, so if really, I mean, in fact, it was Peter Kargasaki and Peter and I have had our agreements and our disagreements. Uh, this was a moment of brilliance, which I will give Peter credit for. Uh, he said, we want to be the guys that don't try too hard. That's how we defined ourselves from the very beginning in the Santa Rita Hills. We we're like grandma. We're always home because we never try, you know, we're always making wine. We're always growing grapes. We're always taking care of the sheep and the chickens. If you want to come to our farms, pull up, we'll put a couple glasses on the upended wine barrel. We'll pour you some wine. And if you're lucky, we'll have a few bottles to sell you. And why did the Santa Rita Hills never really be like strike the imagination of American wine? Well, for the first five vintages, five, 10 vintages, we drank it all. There wasn't nearly enough. There was no, there was no uh, sort of a critical mass of the wine that could really get out into the marketplace. And when uh, the vineyards really started coming online in the late 90s and the early uh, 21st century, that's when we started seeing people really paying attention because people would taste the Chardonnay and go, there's no way this was grown in California. They're tasting Pinot Noir and saying, how much Syrah did you put in that? And it's like, well, you know, are you from Oregon? Because we understand why you're jealous, but for God's sake, with what we have in the Santa Rita Hills, we don't ever need to put anything in that Pinot Noir. And if you think we do, you're just you're just hating. Jealous. So yeah, that's kind of a little bit uh, of what I, uh, what I said. Yeah, of course, building something. The question is Santa Rita Hills had the opportunity to be something so special. What is it that, de that defines Los Alamos? Value. That's not sexy. If you want the best ones from the Los Alamos Valley, you go to Aliso's Canyon, you go to Dovecote, you go to you know, the Martian Vineyard that Joey Tensley's now starting to take over. As far as I understand, you look at Manfred's, uh, Manfred's stuff, you look at the uh, new vineyards that are going in at Nolan Ranch. There's some really exciting stuff happening in Aliso's Canyon and I look forward to doing an entire show on that, uh, the moment that it, uh, that it uh, becomes official in the Federal Register. Awesome. Cool guys, I think I'm going to close up before I, I uh, lose my power. I do, uh, I'm looking over and we've got Beth. Thank you, Beth. Beth is giving us cheers to uh, a great harvest. Jim is also agreeing on the Tablas Creek uh, blend. And obviously when the Santa Barbara guy starts talking about the elegance of a Paso wine, we're probably talking about Tablas Creek. Yes. Slow is the Bolomover white zone in the South Central Coast. You know, I mean, Arroyo Grande Valley, you know, the Arroyo Grande Valley, as well as, um, you know, um, Edna Valley. God, those wines are great. Uh, just. Uh, just went, uh, uh, went out into uh, Edna Valley and tasted just a couple of months ago. And again, the wines really are stunning. And whoever's making the best wine between Santa Maria Valley, Santa Rita Hills, uh, Edna Valley, Arroyo Grande, it's all about vintage. It's all about passion. It's love, how you farm and what happens during the vintage. Absolutely. Thanks again, Amy. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, thanks again. Uh, I'll be uh, uploading this one as well. I'm back on Wednesday. We're going to do the same darn thing, but we're going to be talking about red wines and uh, talking a little bit more about blends and Zin and Cabernet. We're even going to talk about Central Coast Pinot Noir. So that'll be absolutely loads of fun. Cool. So I hope uh, Phil, so loved, <laughs> Phil says the kinks rule. That was from Bob Lindquist, who's one of the great believers in the kinks as a rock and roll band. No, yeah, well, I'm sure the I'm sure the hospitals will have uh, generators, and I'm just stoked. Um, don't hear this very often, but thank you, PG&E, uh, for keeping me online and uh, keeping my show going. So, everyone out there, have a fantastic night. Make sure to be safe. Uh, trust science. Trust doctors. Protect scientists. Protect doctors. Wear a mask. That would be a really smart thing to do when you go into public. And just remember, you know. 2020 was a great opportunity for all of us to learn technology, to learn how to go in front of a screen and say hello to people all over the world. It's been a great opportunity to connect uh, virtually, but we'll be back hopefully in a few months. Once we become vaccinated, once we d develop a, a safe way to be together again, I look forward to being with all of you again. As I always say, find someone in your family, find someone in your neighborhood, find someone maybe you don't know very well and offer them support. Offer your neighbor something free. Deliver something to an elderly neighbor. Put something on next door. Tell people that you've got a half an hour tomorrow to help people do a couple deliveries. We're all in this together. 
And for all of us, because I know anyone smart enough to watch this show also is smart enough to know that we have to protect the most vulnerable populations uh, within uh, the United States and all the areas around it. It's really, really important that we do this not only for ourselves, but for the people that really, really need our help. So thanks everyone for stopping in Day Drinking with Wes Hagen, White Wines of the Central Coast. I think we had a good one tonight and I look forward to seeing all of you on Wednesday as long as I have power and uh, it's not too damn hot in here. It's gonna be hotter on Wednesday. It's gonna be the peak of the heat spike and I'm drinking red wine in a house without, without uh, air conditioning. So we'll see how that goes. And uh, if anything, it'll at least be fun to watch me sweat. Awesome guys, take good care of each other. And if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Talk to you all soon and looking forward to it. And uh, if you wanna see a replay of this, I'll put it up on IGTV as well as uh, Facebook Live on Jay Wilkes Wine Santa Barbara. Thanks again, guys. Have a great night.